Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the, this is the fifth edition of the Long Point Debate, uh, which has been held every election cycle since uh, 2007. Thank you. My name is Dave Emmenheiser, and I'm president of the Sea Bluff Homeowners Association, and uh, I'm proud to serve as your moderator this evening. Uh, Marion Hall, who's uh, uh, bringing, you know, helping everybody come in. If you want to give Marion your questions, uh, she'll slip them to me. It looks like we already got 25, which I'm not sure uh, we'll get all, to all of them tonight. But uh, thank you very much. And, and then the only cautionary note is when you make a question, please make sure it's just to everyone that, that's running this evening. Uh, before we get to the, the, the uh, debate, let me uh, thank uh, the candidates. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, when you embark on something to get elected or get reelected, uh, it's really an arduous task. I mean, some people really enjoy it, but your, your feet get tired and your bank account gets drained. And so uh, uh, I, I just, I think it's wonderful that we've got five publicly, uh, public spirited uh, people who are running for the three seats this year. Mayor Jim Knight, Mayor Pro Tem Susan Brooks, uh, Councilman Jerry Dehovic. Uh, former Councilman Ken Dida and Attorney uh, Greg Royster, and let's give them a rousing round of applause. <laughs> As most of you know, the uh, election is going to be held uh, on November 3rd uh, for the three seats uh, on the Rancho Palos Verdes uh, uh, Council, and, and, and uh, this evening we have five candidates. Uh, before I get to the rules tonight, let me introduce our volunteers and our sponsors and city staff. Uh, Bill Henry, who I see in the back of the room, and is a, who's a president of the Sea Hill Association. Marion Hall, who's a past president of the Sea Hill Association. Uh, and uh, Earl Butler, where's Earl from uh, Via Paci uh, President of Via Pacifica Homeowners Associ Association. I expect uh, Lowell Wiedemeyer to be through our door. He's uh, the past uh, president of the Abalone Cove Association. And then for uh, the Siebel uh, Association, I have the pleasure of serving as president, as I mentioned. And uh, let's see, we have Jolene Merrill, uh, who is on our board. Bill Tillotson, who's on our board, uh, and then uh, uh, Bob, uh, Bob Nelson, who is, uh, is a past president and current chairman of the uh, RPB uh, uh, plan Planning Commission. Uh, Bob will serve as our timekeeper this evening. And uh, I want to thank, uh, especially thank our, our city staff uh, who have supported our efforts to bring this event to you. Doug Wilmer, uh, uh, our city manager, uh, Carla Mariana, uh, Dan Troutman, who's head of the parks, uh, Marcella uh, Lemke, uh, Mark uh, Doty, and, uh, uh, and, and Rocco. And Rocco, I, I, I apologize for not getting your last name uh, uh, from, from RPV TV. We also have outside at the front desk, we've got uh, uh, Rick and Emily and Brittany who uh, set things up and, and organized and, and we'll all appreciate the fact that they got in and turned the air conditioning up at about five o'clock. So let's have a round of applause for, for the people that helped us. <laughs> Let me just, you know, quickly, uh, some people, I, I got a question the other day, well, what's, what's, you know, what's the Long, what's the Long Point neighborhood? And uh, uh, so the Long Point neighborhood is the, the, the part of Rancho Palos Verdes that kind of starts with uh, Cherenea and runs over to Abalone Cove. It's a, it's a peninsula that sticks out in the, in the uh, Pacific Ocean. And uh, we have a little bit of everything in our five HOAs from uh, oceanfront homes, the single residents, the condos, the apartments, and as I mentioned, Cherenea Resort. And so we have the same problems as the rest of the city, but at, at other times uh, our, our problems are a little bit different. Uh, the rules this evening, uh, uh, we have a real treat because uh, we only have five candidates and therefore we'll have an opportunity to hear in detail from each of them about their vision for our great uh, city and their guiding principles of good government. Uh, each candidate will have three minutes to introduce themselves and let's, why don't we do that from the podium, let's do the opening and closings from, from the podium and then uh, uh, once we get into the Q&A, uh, each candidate will be asked a, I'm sorry, the, the candidates will be asked a common question by the moderator and you'll have three minutes to respond, you know, unless you want to make it a little bit shorter. 
at the end of the question and answer period, uh, uh, each candidate will have uh, three minutes for the concluding remarks. Bob Nelson will be our timekeeper. Bob, any uh, rules of the road that you want to talk about? <laughs> I can't see you. <laughs> Come on, you got to sit up here. Can you sit up here, Bob? Really? I cannot see you. <laughs> Sorry. All I see is a nice shirt. <laughs> All you see is that red shirt. I see uh. a pink shirt. Okay, so, so it, it, it's going to be just like in soccer. Uh, oh, yellow is a warning, yellow is a warning and, and red is uh, you're out of time. And, and I'll, I'll start heading up just about here in pretty much. <coughs> Any other uh, questions or issues from the timekeeper? If not, then uh, we'll, uh, we'll go for about an hour. We'll have a, a quick break, uh, see if Mark uh, needs to change the tape or anything like that. And so let's begin with the introductions. And Greg, I'm going to go from le left mm -hmm. to right. What? You want to come up? You wanna, yeah, wait if you would, please. Oh, he's going to have a speaker up there. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. On my left. Are we? Right. Are we? <laughs> oh, okay. we're doing such a good job. I'm going You ready? I'm sorry. Okay, great. Uh, good evening. My name is Greg Royston. I'd like to thank the folks at Long Point and Seabluff for putting on this forum and giving me the opportunity to introduce myself. I'd like to tell you about myself, why I'm running, why I think a change is needed, and finally, what I'll bring to council. First, about me. I'm a small business owner and I'm a real estate attorney with an office here on the Hill. I've got more than 20 years of legal and business experience, including more than eight years in public accounting and tax. I'm not a litigator. I'm a transactional attorney. I work at keeping people and businesses out of court. On a personal level, my family and I have lived in RPV for about 10 years. I'm married and I have two boys, both of whom are in the PV schools, as is my wife who teaches art in the PV schools. I've been involved as a, as a volunteer in AYSO, Little League, PV basketball, and over the last seven years, actively involved in Boy Scouts. I'm on the board for my local HOA of about 300 homes and was recently re-elected by unanimous vote. I act as its liaison to CHOA, which deals with citywide issues. I've also recently finished RPV's Leadership Academy. So why run? I'm constantly trying to teach my kids as a parent and through Boy Scouts the importance of giving back. For me, it's about practicing what I preach. It's about integrity and accountability it's about helping the community because I can. This election is not personal. I just believe that I can offer a different skill set. It's about trying to make our city better. It's about having a sense of humility and respect and a willingness to listen to those that we serve, even if we disagree with them. It's about a mindset that change is not a bad thing. We've managed to change the hierarchy in City Hall with a new city manager, a new city attorney, and a new finance director. Now it's time to continue the job. We need new blood on the council. We shouldn't settle for the status quo. That's not good enough. I'm a firm believer that RPV's best days are in front of us, not behind us. We don't need four more years of gridlock on Green Hills and the half-hearted oversight it's received. We need people who have real-world business and legal experience and understand that the answer to the problem is not, as one council would have you believe, to, dis to disinter bodies from the mausoleum. That would only invite dozens of new lawsuits. We don't need this. We can do better. It's time to get a new set of skills on council. Residents want to be listened to, not ignored. Case in point, the homeowners over on Western Avenue. Certain council members have appeared to be more interested in appeasing other large public agencies rather than their own constituents. People are concerned about public safety and the rash of crime and the fact that it took so long for this council to acknowledge that and implement any change. One wonders why, one wonders how many crimes could have been prevented, including the burglary of my own home had this council simply acknowledged that crime was and still is an important issue and dealt with it. In sum, I won't turn a blind eye to public safety. I will bring a willingness to listen, even when I disagree. Equally as important, though, I will bring a legal background to the council, of which there is none. If I'm elected, people will know that they can count on me to ask tough questions, get answers, and not drag my feet. That they can count on me to hold people accountable, integrity, and period. Thank you. I appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Thank you very much, Greg. Ken? Is this microphone on? Okay, very good. Yeah, my name is Ken Dider. My family moved to our present home back in 1961. 
1970, I was part of the six people on the policy committee of Save Our Coastline, which orchestrated the incorporation of Rancho Palos Verdes. I was fortunate enough to be elected the first city council, serving three terms and a stint as mayor. After that time, I spent about uh, the next 40 years on just about every committee and commission uh, that the city had. In fact, in 2009, the city council voted me unanimously to replace uh, Peter Gardner, who had passed away. <coughs> there are seven things I'd like to talk about, but time today won't allow me to do all seven of them at this point. So let me just touch on two. One of the things I'd like to do is reestablish council oversight. Now, don't let people tell you that oversight is micromanagement. They are two very different and distinct things. Oversight is knowledge. Micromanagement is interference. With a lot more knowledge on the council and a more diligent effort, you intend to take that and create an a atmosphere in the, in the city with the people and the uh, staff to be more diligent, more thorough in their work, make fewer mistakes. Because let's face it, mistakes cost money. And it doesn't cost the city money. The city has no money. The only money it has is the money it gets from you on taxes. So they're spending your money either on extra staff time or potential litigation. So we need to improve that oversight by the council so they have a better knowledge of what's going on. The second thing I'd like to talk about is transparency. You take a look at some of the uh, agenda items and you'll say, this meets transparency goal this, this meets transparency goal that. A goal is a definitive end product with a schedule and the budget. And I'll grant you that most of those don't meet that test. Transparency needs to be something more definitive. The city did adopt a spreadsheet for compensation with the employees. They modeled it after the one I spent two years developing with the city staff and some of the council members. It was the first in the nation, I think, and it's a great beginning. They've taken another step. The other step has been OpenGov. OpenGov is at a higher level, doesn't get down to the details that you need <coughs> to get to so that you really know what's going on because you need to look at what has passed by the voters and what the ordinance says. An example is we passed the storm drain user fee, yet the ordinance says water quality and uh, runoff. That's too broad an issue. We need to get more definitive. Thank you. Thank you. A round of applause for Ken. <laughs> Jerry, you want to be a, I guess it's an option. You can come up or sit. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I do enough sitting. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for taking the time out to be with us tonight and giving me the opportunity to speak to all of you. My name is Jerry Dehovic, and I've had the pleasure of being one of your city council members for almost four years now. I also served as mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes in 2014. As I've said many times before, serving on this council truly is an honor and a privilege for me. And I'm very humbled and, and grateful for the opportunity to be your representative and work on your behalf. The last four years has gone by very, very quickly. I'm proud, actually very proud, of my last four years on council and the record I've established. As I've said many times before, I love the city of Rancho Palos Verdes and I'm passionate about the city and its future. I want to continue to be an integral part of shaping that future. I, like you, care deeply about our city. We are really, truly very all lucky to be living here, and I can honestly say that I don't think there's a finer city in this great country of ours. One of the primary reasons I enjoy serving on council is that I do believe in the ideal of service, the practice of getting involved, proactively giving back to the community, and being part of the solution. As such, I believe with my experience in serving on council, my education, my military training, and my 28 years of business experience, I do offer a unique skill set and expertise and perspective to continue working for the betterment of Rancho Palos Verdes. Quickly, by way of background, I was born in San Pedro and raised on the east side of the hill in Rancho Palos Verdes. I'm the only candidate who can proudly say I grew up in RPV. I'm a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and I attended undergraduate pilot training. I currently am an owner, partner, and director of a large investment brokerage firm in Orange County. 
I've served on numerous independent industry committees, panels, boards, and also as an expert witness in many legal and arbitration actions. My expertise is in financial, compliance, regulatory, corporate governance, and in employee matters. I owned a small business for five years in Rancho Palos Verdes, and I also served as vice chair of the Finance Advisory Committee in 2011. I was also again mayor in 2014. My primary objectives on council are simple, and they have been and always will be to protect, preserve, and improve our quality of life. I believe that starts in dealing aggressively with public safety issues and our infrastructure issues. Second is ensuring that the city's financial health and well-being is, is mentored through responsible, conservative fiscal policies. I will continue to run the city like a business, making the often tough decisions between needs versus wants. Third is true transparency, oversight, and accountability. The council works for the citizens of Rancho Palos Verdes, and if re-elected, I will work to ensure full and complete transparency in all city matters. I keenly understand that I'm accountable only to you, the residents of Rancho Palos Verdes. And finally, we need to protect our rural heritage by balancing our beautiful open space with the need for intelligent development and active use facilities for all residents. I look forward to discussing these issues with you tonight and well into the future. Thank you very much. Jim. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Dave, and uh, thank the uh, uh, Long Point Homeowners Association um, for this, putting on this, this particular debate, for uh, the residents to get to know the candidates. It's really important for a democratic process. I've been really involved with the city ever since I moved here 17 years ago. Um, I'm really honored to be serving on the council since 2011 and currently your mayor. Uh, it's been a great honor to do that. Um, I just want to share with you, I do have some personal background in the real estate business uh, with construction contracts, uh, complex financial aspects, and uh, legal issues. And what I did was in the Venice area, I created a whole new business model whereby I went in and restored uh, historic buildings uh, in the Venice area and made a good business model out of it. At the same time, I felt good about what I was doing because I was preserving the architecture and the culture of the area. So I look for creative ways of doing things in terms of our community and looking for ways to make it a better place to live and preserve some of the culture and history we have. Um, I served eight years on the Planning Commission and I think Bob can testify with me that it's, a, it's quite a challenging thing to be doing, uh, but it really gives you a great learning ground of land use issues which are some of the most important things we deal with in the city So when it comes to council. Uh, since 2011, I've been very busy. I've been elected first vice president of the South Bay Cities Council of Government. I'm the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission. Um, I'm also a, uh, a voting delegate of the California League of Cities, the Selection Committee of Los Angeles Board of uh, uh, Supervisors, and the sanitation, two sanitation districts. I, I tell you that because uh, being part of these boards, I've been able to accomplish a lot for the city. I'm trying to protect your local control from state legislation that's trying to take that control away, save hundreds of thousands of dollars with conservation measures for our city, and use this networking to bring forth consulting and funding opportunities for our city. As to my goals, they're really primarily preserve the quality of life we have, and that entails maintaining a sound financial model for our city, protecting and preserving our open spaces, and making sure you as residents don't get aced out of enjoying those, those particular resources because your pay, taxpayers' money are paying for, uh, for uh, keeping them maintained. Preserving neighborhood character on the, on the Planning Commission, I dealt a lot with the neighborhood compatibility and that was something that was very important to me. Public safety is very important to me too. Uh, Sheriff's Department need to support them, need to have neighborhood watch and get the community involved in that. And also we need to tackle the infrastructure, which is a big problem we're, we're dealing as a council right now and we need to make sure we have enough funding uh, available to prior properly prioritize these infrastructure projects for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Susan? Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you to the homeowners associations for this, this lovely opportunity. Uh, I'm no stranger to public service. I'm no stranger to this community. Most people know me. I've been here for 30 years. 
I've been working in, as a teacher in the public schools here. I graduated from Columbia University <coughs> with a master's degree in uh, a long time ago, and uh, have been able to really make some wonderful strides with this wonderful community. I was privileged to serve on the uh, city council in the early 90s and, and early, prior to that on the planning commission. Uh, I came back to the city council after having served on various boards and nonprofits throughout this community um, because I was concerned about the direction that I saw the city going. I think that in the last four years, this city council has done so much. We have made great strides. We have opened up great transparency options. We have rebid all the major contracts. And as a result, we have a new city manager, we have a new city attorney, and every council member would probably agree that I was the driving force behind the hiring of our new city attorney. This is very important because we have new challenges to face. You know, the Pope was here last week, and he talked about children, and he talked about grandparents, and the legacy. The children are the strength for the future, and the grandparents are the memory, and they're the principled people. Without the grandparents giving the principles to their grandchildren, we wouldn't have any future. Fortunately, we have great schools in Palos Verdes, and we have wonderful city with great principles. I support the underlying principles of low density, semi-rural environment, whether we operate with fiscal prudence, but we have some really important goals to look forward to. We have employed new um, crime prevention programs that have been, they're going to be measured. We've added major changes to uh, our sheriff's budget um, because of the wake of crime. Crime has increased throughout the state. Thank you, Prop 47 and AB 109. But we in Rancho Palos Verdes have put our money where our mouth is, and we're going to make these changes. So you're going to see increased patrols, cameras, more volunteers on patrol, a lot of activity. And quality of life. Everybody here, you look around. In the last four years, we have changed drastically. What is going on? I mean, from the switchbacks to kids jumping in the coves to the reason to make these changes, I was instrumental in making the motion to jettison Gateway Park for that reason. We needed to realize that we have to serve the people in our community. We need to put our residents first. And I look forward to the evening with you. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Susan. Uh, everybody's microphone working, I hope. If not, uh, yep. we'll get to borrow your neighbors. And uh, Susan, uh, we're going to start on your end. Sure. Hit me. Hit you. <laughs> what is the greatest challenge to the city's infrastructure, and what do you think the city should do about the city council? I'm sorry, should do about it. Wow, our infrastructure needs are massive. Um, our greatest challenges. Um, they not only lie with the landslide, which we all know is, a, is, prob is the largest landslide in the Western Hemisphere, but they also, our infrastructure needs are our aging streets and roads, our storm drains. Um, we have a variety of problems that must be met. So it's estimated that we have $90 million in, storm in um, massive infrastructure needs. On top of that, there's an additional $40 million of state and federal water quality mandates. You know, when I was on this council 22 years ago, we didn't have all these state and federal governmental regulations that come with grants and a lot of other things that are very, um, strings come attached with these and it becomes a real problem. So I look forward to the opportunity to, uh, to uh, grapple this with our new infrastructure management committee and they are working together with our Finance Advisory Committee and together with the Storm Oversight, the, war, um, the Oversight Committee, so that we can get an assessment of exactly what priorities and needs we are going to have for this massive challenge that we face. 
Okay, thank you. And uh, let me remind everyone, we're gonna hold applause until the candidates uh, concluding remarks. And Mark just told me, uh, ask everybody to pull the microphones closer to them. Greg, probably you in particular. Great, thank you very much. Okay, and uh, Jim, uh, uh, same, same question. Okay, yes, we do have a lot of infrastructure needs. It's not as if our city is completely falling apart. I mean, obviously our streets are nicely paved as they are, but it takes a lot to maintain that. We as a council are looking at a longer term process than just to fix it and try to fix it and try to keep it going. We want to, let, we want to take a 30 year look at this and make sure we have the funding available to take care of these things. Storm drains are very important. I don't know if you remember Western Avenue when it had a sinkhole. Um, that is a result of a CMP pipe that leaked at the bottom and when the storm came through, uh, it took out the ground underneath and there you go, you got a hole. Those are the kind of things, some of these storm drains run through underneath the people's homes. Those are the kind of things we really need to be on top of. Uh, the other ash issues, uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Brooks uh, mentioned the MS4 permitting process is coming forth. There's a whole new set of regulations coming down from the LA C uh, County Water Quality Control Board. Uh, that are going to be requiring us to really put a lot of money into uh, our storm drain water quality, uh, both on leaning toward the Santa Monica Bay and into the Machado Lake on the other side. So that's something that's kind of an unknown right now. There's still a battle in terms of what will be required for that. Uh, <coughs> we, we basically, we need to set down and prioritize our infrastructure needs because we don't have enough money, even with the reserves, to take care of all of our needs. So. Mm -hmm. The committees will be helping us look at this, the IMAC and the Financial Advisory Committee uh, and the Water Quality Control, uh, excuse me, the, um, the, the water, um, the storm drain user, fee, the storm drain uh, committee will, will help us uh, take a look at these particular issues and give us some the community input as to what the, prior, the priority is of the public, but that will have to be weighed against the public works who understand uh, really the condition of some of our infrastructure and we at council will have to make some decisions down the road. Very good. Uh, Jerry? Thank you, Dave. Um, as I think of infrastructure, I remember when I first joined council, we had a list of funded and unfunded projects, and I think the unfunded project list totaled somewhere around $130 million. And you know, the sky was falling. We've got all kinds of things to do. We don't have the money to do it. But then we stepped back, or I stepped back, and said, there's a lot of wants versus needs there. And, you know, spending $2 million on Grandview or $3 million on Lower Hass and other, those are all wants. Those aren't needs right now. The city of Rancho Palos Verdes is a very young city. As far as our infrastructure goes, we inherited a lot of it from the county, all of it from the county, actually. Our roads are in the top tier. I think our roads are in great shape. We did a good job on Palos Verdes Drive East. Um, the question basically was, what is our biggest infrastructure uh, issue, Dave? Is that, that yes. the question? You know, there are a lot of infrastructure issues, as, as my two colleagues said here, but the top three, storm drains, sewers, and Portuguese Bend. I didn't hear Portuguese Bend mentioned there. That is a major financial drain on the city. Depending on what year it is, we spend a half a million to a million dollars repaving that road. We're about to spend three million dollars realigning that road. We spend money on dewatering wells. And what was very disconcerting to me is we, we held a special um, uh, meeting uh, on that topic two or three years ago and had many experts there. And the answer, when I asked one of the experts who will remain nameless, when I said, well, what is the solution? We got to be, we can put a man on the moon. We got to be able to at least slow this thing down a little bit, you know, because we can save some money if we slow it down and don't have to do all this remediation. And the answer was, well, in about 250 years, it'll stop moving. That, that, that wasn't a good answer for me, and I was a little taken aback by that, and I took it in the spirit it was intended, but that's not a good answer. I think we can do something there. So uh, I think Portuguese Bend is one of our biggest issues. Storm drains, obviously, the big holes we had there. I think we're doing a good job on that front, and, and we will maintain that. And our sewers are actually in pretty good shape. So short answer is Portuguese Bend, Dave. Thanks. Very good. Thank you, Jerry. Ken? Portuguese Bend outshines about everything else in terms of liability this city has. The council was really concerned the Portuguese of uh, PV Drive East and they buttressed one of the setbacks because it would cut the street in half. What happens when Portuguese and PV Drive South and Portuguese Bend disappears? This is something that is hard to even contemplate. 
would have Portuguese Ben Bay. Uh, 1983, a number of experts, including Dr. Perry Ailey, who everybody remembers as being the geologist who helped us with Abalone Cove and Klondike, and by the way, the Geological Hazard District legislation for those two was created by me and taken to the uh, Senate for approval at the state level. Uh, we didn't use that for Portuguese Bend. However, he and a number of civil engineers come up with a proposal of a preliminary plan. That preliminary plan obviously would need to be refined. It was just a preliminary plan. It would take a bit of time. But in about two or three years, it could have been refined to the point where it would be workable. Now, everybody's concerned about how much money that costs. When we did Abalone Cove, we went for a bond issue, and people said, you're not going to get anybody to buy bonds on moving land. They were all subscribed before we were even out there publishing it. So you can get bonds on that. And so it doesn't have to be a complete uh, city coffers attack. You can bond it. Had we bonded that at the cost estimated back then, over a 30 year period, today, Portuguese Bend would have been controlled approximately to the same degree as Abalone Cove. And just think of the money you spend now at 500,000 a year for just replacement. We're putting a Band-Aid on a cancer. We're not treating the cause, we're treating the end product which is the problem. That could have been done then, it would have been done by now, and I think this council or any future council has to bite the bullet and say, hey, we're gonna treat our biggest real infrastructure problem. The others, we can fund in a while through our own reserves and uh, the money we get from TOT and other tax revenues. Portuguese bend your bond and you can get it done. I am convinced. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Greg, same question. Can you borrow cans? Sure. While Mark works on the, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Very good. Um, I, I think in terms of, uh, of the physical asset here in the city, I think I would have to agree with Jerry and, and Ken on this, that it would be Portuguese Bend. Um, the, the problem as I see it is that we don't have a long-term plan for Portuguese Bend. Um, one of the things that I, I learned from the city is that they're in process of trying to create a long-term plan, but they don't have one. It's a, piece, it's a piecemeal plan. Um, they need to, to be able to deal with that on a, you know, in, in a bigger picture, and, and you know, whether it's a bonding issue, as, as Ken suggested, or, or something else, those are things that have to get looked into. Um, on a regular basis, I think it's really important to be able to take care of deferred maintenance. Um, so that you don't let your assets depreciate. But more importantly, I think, it's the preservation of the money that we have. Um, and it's really gonna be important that we don't spend it in silly ways, where we, we get involved in projects, and a lot of times projects, I think, um, the, the popular ones are the ones with the big dollar amounts. Um, they, oftentimes people wanna have a feather in their cap and basically say, we basically managed a big project <coughs> like San Ramon and it was $19 million and now they're getting big awards for it. Um, there are issues with San Ramon. Yeah, it's great, we got it done now, but there's still issues that, that, that come into play with that. Uh, you know, for instance, we've now accepted all of the liability. It used to belong to LA City and LA County. Now we've moved it and now it's an entirely, it's entirely belongs to the city. Um, <clears throat> I agree with Jerry in that it's a wants versus needs, and so we've got to be really careful in terms of how we prioritize how we're going to spend this money. Um, every day, the planning department, they're going to be getting uh, uh, projects to work on. Um, they've now basically told the council, it's like, we can't take any more. Stop giving them to us, <laughs> at least for the time being, because they can't handle what they have. So. Um, yeah, that's, that's about it. Okay, thank you very much. Jim, we're gonna start uh, this next question with, uh, with you, and, and I've gotta tell you, I've got about 35 questions up here, so be patient with me. Uh, topic, crime. Crime in RPV has dramatically risen. What specifically have you, and that's underlined, uh, done as a council person, or would you do, or, or would you propose to do, 
uh, for the non-incumbents to address this problem. Let me, let me read that again. Crime in RPB has uh, risen dramatically. What specifically have you done as a council person or would you do uh, if elected to address the problem? And Jim, we'll begin with you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yes, this is a problem in our community. There's been some legislation that hasn't helped. Prop 47 has reduced some of the drug uh, 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 crimes from uh, misdemeanor, to, from, from felonies down to misdemeanor. Um, myself and my council, fellow council members here have increased the budget for the sheriff. We have two additional patrols uh, we put on uh, to, to patrol around just for Rancho Palos Verdes. We have a, uh, a, a automatic license plate recognition camera that's on PB Drive South. We put that into place. Um, when I first met Captain Bolin, it was at a Contract Cities conference, and we sat down together and we immediately hit it off because we both feel one of the important things that really helps prevent crime is to get the neighborhoods involved. Get out there, get the sheriffs out there to talk to the neighborhoods, let them know what the crime uh, trends are, sit down and talk to them about how they can prevent crime. There are still people that are leaving their cars on the street unlocked with a computer in the front, front seat. Those kind of things, but there's more, even more things we can do to help the citizens know and get them the numbers they can call to the sheriff if they see something that doesn't seem right in their neighborhood. There actually has been a criminal caught as a result of someone calling in the sheriff and said, there's this car out here, it doesn't seem right, it's a blue whatever make it was, and I think they even wrote down the license plate number. That person was caught uh, uh, having stolen some property within the community. So it's really uh, a multitude of things. I also want to encourage the volunteer uh, sheriff deputies. Uh, they help a lot because what they do is they can take care of a lot of the things that the sheriffs might have to be like at the desk or the counter or something and get the deputies out in the field uh, uh, patrolling around the community. So those volunteers help a lot. They're, they're tremendous help to the city. So I, I really feel there's a multitude of things we have done and we can continue to be vigilant and make sure we focus on exactly what crimes are happening and how to prevent them. Very good. Cherry? Thanks, Dave. Um, <clears throat> it's difficult to act unilaterally and, and make a difference, but several of the things I've done personally is I've gotten very involved with, with my HOA. I'm the block captain, um, and, and I'm intimately involved. We're looking at cameras in my particular neighborhood. I've also spoken at many, many HOAs over the course of the years um, and, and actually, to Jim's point, talked about what they can do to prevent crime. It's an education process. When you got people, including my wife sometimes, leaves her car unlocked and leaves something in the car, you're asking for problems. Um, you know, People need to be educated. It needs to be hammered over and over and over because a lot of the crime we see is crimes of opportunity and, and is clearly preventable as far as I'm concerned. One of the things that I did do, and, and I was adamant about, uh, and I hate to use the term, but it's more boots on the ground. I was an advocate, a staunch advocate, of getting those two additional sheriff units out there. I know that there are some in the community that think that they're too expensive. I disagree. Safety is job one on this council, public safety. Job 1A is infrastructure, but safety is job one. And I believe, as Captain Bolin has confirmed in many conversations with me, that the more sheriff's presence you have out there, it is significantly a deterrent in crime. And you move people around, they're not in one spot. They, you, you, you know, th these, these criminals are smart. They know where the patrols are gonna be and what have you, so we have to be a little bit smarter than them. And those are the kind of things that I talk about with Captain Bolin. We also did fund the volunteers on patrol and encourage uh, people to participate by offering to pay for their, for their uniforms and training and actually, uh, bring on additional vehicles for these people to get out there. Again, more boots on the ground, so there's a visibility here. Uh, the ALPR readers, I think that's great. I voted for them. The, 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 the uh, um, stationary readers are a cost-effective tool and should help. But there is, there's going to be a debate at some point about cameras at the primary entrances of the city. And I know that that's a big, uh, big topic for a lot of people, and it depends how you do it. I'm not an advocate for... Uh, filming everybody and keeping it in perpetuity and turning it over to Homeland Security, but there, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of different ways that we can uh, that we can do something with respect to video surveillance. We only have five or six primary entrances in the city, so I'd I'd like to investigate that. 
Um, you know, if we kept the tape for two weeks to help us uh, solve a crime that has taken place or have a nice sign out there when people drive and smile, you're on video camera, whatever it is, something to take a look at. I'm not sure where all that goes, but we have to do something. There is nothing worse than a resident coming to me or one of my colleagues and telling you that they don't feel comfortable in their own home because they were violated and, and it's just a horrific thing. So we, we've got to, we do take this very seriously and we'll continue to do so. Very good, thank you. Ken, I believe you're next. More boots on the ground. Yes, that's got to be done. But it was done when we had the original contract with the Sheriff's Department, which I negotiated with them. We, instead of having uh, patrol cars sitting around corners and uh, on side streets to catch speeders, we had them driving the streets almost constantly. How many of you experienced the fastest reaction time of a human being when you see a police car and you're driving down a road and your foot comes off the accelerator. You talk about traffic calming. That's traffic calming. Now, the burglaries that occur in automobiles, although they change over time, for the past 10 years, the trend line has been flat. Okay, so we get peaks and valleys, but there isn't a real different trend line. However, home burglaries are on the rise and the trend line is really has an uptick to it. A lot of that is education on the part of the people. It'd be nice if we lived as we did back in the 50s, could leave your front door open and things like that. You can't do that anymore. And with the way they're turning criminals out of the prisons today, they're looking for something else to do and they're gonna have an opportunity to do it if you leave your door open, if you leave your unlocked, that sort of thing. People have garage door openers and yet you go down the streets and garage doors are always open. They wonder why things are stolen. We need to educate the people as the others have said, but I think we need to revisit the contract and the performance measures that we put forth when we started. Over time, they have eroded and I don't believe they, can, they are as effective as they can be. Thank you. Very good, thank you, Greg. Boy, Greg, we've really cursed you tonight. Mark? Look, look. <coughs> Is he all right now? Are we good to go? Okay. You certainly got everybody's attention there. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, let's talk about the sheriff for a second. One of the things that they do really, really well is they respond. I've called them on numerous, numerous occasions, and they show up. The problem is they're human. They can only be in so many places at one time. And with the addition of two additional sheriffs or two additional shifts per week, um, I think when we have a huge budget surplus like we have, uh, all of a sudden $250,000 a year for one person for one shift per week, $250,000 to me, that sounds like a lot of money for an annual basis. When a sheriff probably makes sixty or $70,000 a year, why in the world are we spending $250,000? As, a, as n not being on the council, this is one of the questions that I would have asked Bolin. How do you justify this $250,000 per person? It's this $500,000. That's a lot of money. And the problem is, is when we have these big budgets, these huge budget surpluses, is that it becomes silly money. And people just think, ah, oh, we got this extra money, just throw it at it. The problem I, I also see is that I don't think enough questions are being asked in terms of options. Um, in the last debate that we had, you know, some people ventured to say that it's like we can't have private security here because it doesn't work. Not true. The city of LA partners up with LAPD. I used to work downtown for years. They use private security down there and it works beautifully. They, have, they take care of all the problems. The city of Downey uses private security. It works. There's no reason why we can't be using this too. I talked to Bolin and he agrees. You need more eyes on the street. Okay. But the question is, do you need guns or do you need phones? If you got a phone and you've got private security and they call Lomita Sheriff Station, it goes back to the first things that I said. They respond. If the private security is circling our streets for $500,000 a year, you can get a veritable army on the streets. They respond. They tell somebody, you got a problem down in Go Golden Cove. You got a problem over on Western Ave. You got a problem in Silver Square. You got a problem down by Jerry's house by Trump. They respond, they know where to go. 
But the problem is if you only have two people, you don't know where to go. They're, they're, they're human, and it's only two shifts per week. And that's one of the misconceptions that I think people don't understand, is that it is only two shifts per week. It's not a 24-7 deal. We don't have that. Um, the other thing that I would say is that, you know what, this problem was identified more than two years ago. And all of a sudden, this month is the first time we got new sheriffs. Don't drag your feet. That's what I would do. Very good. Thank you. Susan? So, like a little correction time. Um, these two patrol vehicles are um, full-time dedicated patrol vehicles. And, by the way, these results are going to be measured meaning that within the next year, the city council has made a decision that we want to see measurable results. When you add boots on the ground, you want to see a reduction in crime. We also want to deal with the fact that we have our strategic team, which are, is our detectives. Um, I have been instrumental as your uh, representative on the Regional Sheriff's Commission Committee with um, Councilman Misitich to ensure that we actually have the proper detectives working with us. And we work with the agencies. I am your actually representative together with Councilman Mizetich for we do oversight of the Sheriff's Department. And that's how the agency works. We work together with the other two cities, Rolling Hills and Rolling Hills Estates. And when I was mayor, when this crime in 2013 was really spiking, I was instrumental in getting a peninsula-wide bulletin the exact same bulletin to every single member of the Palos Verdes Peninsula, when that includes Palos Verdes Estates. All five emblems were on it. It told everybody we're in the middle of this crime wave and for everybody to pay attention to these needs that have to be met. Also, I've been instrumental in helping with the ALPR getting to the camera at Palos Verdes Drive South and La Rotunda. That has been a passion of mine because this is an access point, and it has always been these, the, these five access points to the peninsula have really, that is a really vulnerable area. Um, I started this out in 2011. We had one of our neighbors in um, our homeowners association, I was president, was robbed, and they were pushed down, they were elderly in their driveway, and I, ha I called everybody to my house as the homeowners president, and the sheriff came, and we <coughs> buckled down with neighborhood watch. We have probably, I think, one of the strongest <coughs> homeowners associations as a result. And I have since organized neighborhood watch groups as a city councilwoman with at least three other homeowners associations. So what have I done personally? A lot. And outreach, I would say that my little monthly coffees were very, very um, successful. People came, gave us information. I'm looking at one, one of the people in the audience here and uh, how critical that was in specific areas, and we were able to target and address these. Also, I have a newsletter, and my newsletter, if you're interested in getting on it, you can just contact me through the city and I'll put you on it, but it gives a lot of tips about crime and how to stop it. Um, but measured results is key, and volunteers on patrol, we added uh, hours and gave them the opportunity to give citations. So, these locations matter and targeted patrols. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we're going to jump to Jerry. Jerry's going to start out with this next question. Eh, maybe this one could be a quick one. For all, do you have plans for running for a higher office or another position that could prohibit you from completing your term? Jerry? No. <laughs> Thank you. You know, we may get it through all 35 questions tonight after all. Ken? Didn't, then, don't now, and will not. Greg? No. Susan? Been there, done that, no. <laughs> Good. Jim? If I want to stay married, definitely not. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. No, definitely, uh, uh, no, I have no plans at all. <laughs> okay, I'll, I think that person got their question and answered. Uh, oh, this is in, a, in the first person. I use Western Avenue when going to work. Uh, what is the plan for Western and will it delay traffic? And Ken, we're going to start with you on that one. <clears throat> what is the question again? Yeah, let me read it again. I use Western Avenue when going to work. What plan, 
what plans uh, are there for Western, and will it delay traffic? Ken, you're going to start with that one, please. There have been a number of proposals based on a grant that was put together that was, in my opinion, ludicrous. But the people did not understand the problem. The problem is simply traffic. The street just cannot handle the traffic in its current configuration. That needs to change. Ponta Vista is going to have a big impact. There's a potential for the new Navy site that's up for sale who, that has an access near PV Drive North and Western to also create another choke point. These things have to be addressed. We have to make sure that the first and foremost problem is that vehicular traffic can flow. The other problem is they talk about beautifying it. Some of the beautification was to move all the, have private people move their buildings, tear them down and move them to the sidewalk, uh, put in a rail down, a, down the middle. Uh, th those were plans that people who did that wasted your money because it was your tax dollars that paid for it, even though it was a grant from another agency. We can do a lot to beautify that. One of the big problems in one area is telephone poles right in the middle of the sidewalk. I mean, who have heard of that? Yeah. Uh, you know, these are the kinds of things that can be done easily. Don't sit there and worry about bicycle traffic when you have a problem with uh, automobile traffic that is so congested people can't get through. And by that congestion, if you add bicycles, you're just making it a bigger problem. Very good, Greg. Um, Western Ave is controlled by Caltrans. That's the big elephant in the room. You got to deal with those guys. Um, Ponta Vista has not been taken into consideration. We don't have any traffic studies about what's going on over there. Um, one wonders, you know, we've gone through this whole rigmarole of hiring consultants and they didn't listen to anything that they told us here. Um, but I'm sure we paid them full time. Yeah. Why did we spend all the money and, and go through this whole process uh, when LA, they never had the funding to begin with? Um, I think we would have been better off spending the money on lottery tickets because that's about, the, that's about as, as good as it did. Um, but the biggest problem that I had in going to this planning commission meeting in which you know, Bob Nelson chaired, you know, he talked about the big elephant in the room you know, being across the street, and nobody was talking about the traffic that was going to be created by Ponta Vista. Um, but the biggest problem that I had is the fact that the, the neighbors weren't listened to, and that there was this agenda that was basically trying to kowtow to the people in LA and other cities because they wanted it, and we were trying to curry favor with them, and we ignored our own constituents. And I think that was wrong. Very good. Thank you. Susan? You know, what's ironic here is that um, something happened in the transition between Councilman Buscaino and when, um, count when Janice Hahn was a councilwoman, because I talked with her about this, and uh, they, we couldn't figure out how can anybody think we're going to have bike lanes on Western Avenue. I'm sorry, but that is, I live on the east side of the hill. I conduct most of my commerce there. I go to the stores there and I sit in that crazy, insane traffic. And when we had the sinkhole, by the way, it was even worse. So um, yes, no new sinkholes. But this Western Avenue uh, vision plan, I believe it was $110,000, and it was set out. Um, these people came forward with the plan. And uh, yes, the buildings were up to the road, and they had this identified. But I would say that. In the course of the problems with the bike lanes um, that um, Janice Hahn and Joe Buscaino were dealing with, you know what I'm talking about, the ones on Westmont where they reduced it to from two lanes to one lane, 
And if you're on 25th Street, where it was reduced from two lanes to one lane, that's crucial time period, especially uh, in that area at 25th Street when people are going to work, leaving the Palos Verdes Peninsula or coming back, to have that reduced to one lane. Those bike lanes are very wide. And I think that that really turned people off. And when you look at whatever grant idea is being proposed for the area between, like, think Prime and Cemetery, there has to be something because that Caltrans is the reason why the gridlock is there. It's a nightmare. It's like Solomon. You've got you're on one side of the street, L.A., and the other side of the street, Rancho Palos Verdes, and down the middle of the street is Caltrans, and they make all the decisions, and they're the ones in charge. And when you get three bureaucracies in charge, that's three bureaucracies too many. It is, a, it is very, very difficult. I'm not saying it can't be dealt with, but we really need to sit down and look at this seriously uh, together with the councilmen and what is a viable alternative. Listen to the people who live there. Those people were there, they wanted to be heard, and they were not heard, and they are our residents and they deserve our respect. Thank you. Thank you. Jim? Yes, uh, Western Avenue uh, is, there's a draft plan going around that uh, was funded by the Southern California Association of Governments uh, that's got a lot of feedback from the community. It's been before the Planning Commission, and there are some issues with it, definitely. Uh, there's two components, too. One deals with a private property section, and that's where we're talking about the buildings and the idea of having them close to the streets. But the main focus I think we need to address right now is the public right-of-way. Uh, and um, there definitely, we have Ponta Vista coming online here. Who knows what's going to happen with the fuel depot that's the uh, uh, federal government maybe giving out to somebody else. Uh, we want to make sure that the traffic is not only not worse than it is, but try to improve that traffic. Being on the South Bay City's Council of Government, I have worked with the Regional Transportation Plan. I've worked with the people in the, that organization, worked with Caltrans. I got on the list a call for projects, a traffic synchronization project that's going to be coming forth down the road. That I think will help with that. That's why I'm using my networking with what I do with these organizations to try to work for you as a city. I don't. Th I think we need to make sure we do not affect negatively affect the traffic there. Uh, and we have a lot of things to issue, a lot of things to deal with there. Uh, I don't think that. Uh, putting some improvements on the public right-of-way is mutually exclusive to making sure the traffic is not affected. Uh, th those two can work together, but it should not affect the actual flow of traffic because that is a real issue there, and I've been down there many times myself waiting traffic, several traffic signals to get through. So that's, that's primary is making sure that that flow is better, and I've been working hard with the regional agencies to get the, f the funding for this uh, synchronization of traffic lights so that we can get the uh, flow going better through there. Very good, thank you. Jerry? Thank you. Um, I'd just like to go on record and say the whole Western Avenue uh, review and, and analysis with respect to improvements has been an abomination, in my opinion. Um, I'm not going to get into beautification, but let's, let's just talk about reality here. When, when I attended the first two sessions at Peck Park, I don't know, two, two and a half years ago, they were talking about putting light rail down the middle of Western. Mm -hmm. They were talking about setting guidelines to force homeowners, I mean, uh, bu business owners, if they ever want to do anything with their building, to move their building street side and put the parking in the back. My understanding is this guy didn't even know anything about our area and wanted to make it a destination. Western Avenue from, from, summer, from First Street to the cemetery is not a destination. There are businesses there, there are restaurants there, but it's a thoroughfare. Now, my beautiful daughter, Gina, here, who attends high school there, I live on the south side of the hill, uh, my wife was traveling this week, and I had the, the, uh, the luxury of taking her to school every morning this week. Okay, I usually go a different way, but I had to take her to school, and I could not believe the traffic that I saw. I actually, we tried, Gina, nod your head if I'm, we tried four different ways. And every way, you don't want to hear what I was saying in the car, but Daddy was not pleased. Um, this, it was, it, it is just a joke, and you have to plan extra time. These single lanes, Westmont, 25th Street, it's a joke. The cars are backed up. Capital Drive, I was backed up 20 cars deep waiting down a three-way stop. It's a joke. 
And that's part of the problem. I just, you know, we have to talk. I understand the whole Caltrans thing. We have to do something because, uh, you know, they're talking about bike lanes. Bike lanes are the topic du jour. That's how you get money for beautification so we can buy new benches. And I'm all for beautification, but think about bike lanes on Western Avenue. Think about an eight-year-old riding their bike next to a car blowing by at 50 miles an hour. It scares the heck out of me, okay? And we're gonna, we're gonna adjust driveways and ingresses and egress. I don't, you don't see kids biking on PCH. It's the same damn thing, okay? Excuse my language, but I'm, I'm very angry about the whole thing. We wasted money on that. Um, it's, it's, uh, we need to do something. I'm not sure what the plan is going forward. There are multiple agencies involved, uh, but we're gonna have to get aggressive with that, and I am 100% not in favor of what's transpired thus far. Very good, thank you. Ken? Oh, he already did it, good. You know, I do that every debate. I get some, you know, too, too many moving parts and not enough up here. Uh, we're going to stop for five minutes so that we can fix Greg's uh, mic. We've got coffee. We've got decaf coffee. We've got cookies back there, lots of cookies. And we're going to start up in five minutes, and I've got some more introductions. <laughs>